The following podcast will contain spoilers and explicit language. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of Yeah, It's That Bad. My name is Joel. And I'm Martin. This is the show that looks at supposedly bad movies and asks the question, is it really that bad? And what that boils down to is that we look at movies that are rotten on Rotten Tomatoes, or most people just think that they're bad, or they're critically hated, or whatever, and we reevaluate that score. Does it really deserve to be that low? Tonight's movie is 2010's Legion, directed by Scott Stewart, starring Paul Bettany, Lucas Black, Tyrese Gibson, Adrian Palicki, Charles S. Dutton, John Tenney, Kevin Durand, Willa Holland, Kate Walsh, and Dennis Quaid. Legion is an apocalyptic supernatural thriller film. This film currently holds an 18% on Rotten Tomatoes. How about a quick plot synopsis? An out-of-the-way diner becomes the unlikely battleground for the survival of the human race. When God loses faith in humankind, he sends his legion of angels to bring on the apocalypse. (laughs) Humanity's only hope lies in a group of strangers trapped in a desert diner with the archangel, Michael. Martin, um, you have a very checkered past with this movie. Tell the people at home. What, what does that mean, a checkered past? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Yeah, you're, you're, you have a, a dark history with this movie. What does that even mean? I did go see it in the uh, theater with a close friend of mine. I was very excited for this movie. I really like movies that are like angel and demon, paranormal kind of related. So. Well, Martin, you invited me to see this movie, and I flat out refused. You I said, said no you way. Said, you said no way, Jose. Yeah. I believe was, quote unquote. I know it's not a good movie, but in my heart, I want it to be a good movie. You know, this movie has a lot of things going for it that I like. Yeah. I really I really like movies that all take place in one spot, especially when it's people are trapped somewhere and they, you know, things escalate and then people go crazy. You know, I love stuff like that. I also really like the idea of angels and demons existing in modern day. I always have to say when a movie like this comes along, it's like, oh, you know, like Constantine. And I'm really sick of saying that because Constantine's not that good of a movie. I'm tired of saying, you know, like Constantine. So I was kind of hoping that this movie would be great so I can say, you know, like Legion. I'm trying to describe this kind of a movie. I also really enjoy Constantine. I know that's not a very good movie, but I really enjoy it. You know, back in 2010, 2009, for whatever reason, Hollywood was obsessed. And they still are to some extent today with uh, apocalyptic movies. They were really in vogue at the time. So we got Legion, which is something that was there. And this came out around the same time as these other movies. Survival of the Dead, City of Ember, Daybreakers, Nine, Dead Snow, 2012, Carriers, Pandorum, Terminator Salvation, The Crazies, Pontypool, The Book of Eli, Zombieland, and The Road. Movies like this that all take place in a single spot. It's all about the character dynamics and how they interact with each other. And I just want to go really quickly, one by one, through all the characters and describe them. Because... I don't know about you, but I thought they were pretty one-dimensional. They were made that way. Yeah, just about all. all They were cardboard cutouts. All right, so let's let's start off right off the bat. Tyrese Gibson. I don't even know what purpose he served in this movie because he did nothing. So, sorry, Tyrese. Move on to the next one. This, in my opinion, heavy hitter. Completely squandered in this movie. Charles S. Dutton. He played a religious one-handed cook and former soldier. Why Charles S. Dutton only had one hand... I don't know. Did it do anything in the movie at all? It was supposed to show that he fought in a war and that he has faith in God. Okay. Because of his experience in the war. Well, it was a waste. Pointless. And I love Charles S. Dunn. He was TV's rock. Yeah, you said that like 50 times 50 while we times. watched it. 50 times. I was like, Did you, uh, I was like hey, like, there's rock. You're like, you're like, look at that. It's rock. I watched He's in this movie. That's TV's rock. <laughs> yeah, rock live. I saw that. You know, <laughs> I, I just kept saying that over and over again. Okay, next person. Adrienne Palicki as Charlie, a downtrodden waitress who is pregnant with what is supposed to be the savior of humanity. The last scion. She just kind of was there. She was preggers, though. What did you expect her to do? Eh. You want her to, like, get into, like, a fight scene with a shotgun? I mean, the the movie is unbelievable as it is, so, I mean, I guess I could have done that. It wouldn't have have stretched my uh, limits of disbelief any further than they've already been stretched in this movie. Okay, so the next person, his name is Lucas Black. He probably has one of the worst names I've heard a movie character have in a really long time. His name was Jeep Hansen. Jeep. That was his name. The other characters were like a rich, wealthy family. There was a mom, the dad, and... They were very uptight. They were really uptight. They they showed you that because they used Purell hand cleanser. Yes, and they they had like their... Willa Holland was their hot daughter. She was either the poor man's Avril Lavigne or the poor man's Michelle Michelle Trachtenberg. Trachtenberg. 
So one or the other, you decide. Either, either way, I thought she was cute. She, she's the most attractive person in this movie. That's not hard to do, though, in this yeah. movie. And, uh, of course, the, the real star of this movie. The Quaid. Dennis Quaid as Bob Hansen, the diner's owner. Now, Dennis Quaid, as I said when we were watching the movie, he was at his absolute Quaidiest in this movie, right? The Quaidometer was off the charts. I've never seen Quaid bring as much Quaid <laughs> to a movie as he did in this one. Oh, man, you could almost taste the Quaid in this movie. Oh, it was palpable. It was unbelievable. It was great. I remember I remember every time he got on the screen, you just smiled. And you're, oh, like, you're, I, like, you're like, he's back. I wrote that in my notes that his <laughs> acting is so wooden and stilted and like he's bored and sleepwalking. His dialogue sounds like it was written for a character with a dialect, <laughs> but Dennis Quaid refused to do the dialect. <laughs> So it's just so like it's just these weird phrasings of words. It's very strange. The phrasings made no sense. No one in America speaks like that. I'll tell you this, you know, we have a couple patron saints on this show. Emily Browning, Nicolas Cage, and somewhere towards the top of that pantheon, is Dennis that Quaid, Quaid is smiling down upon us <laughs> right now from heaven. Like he's amazing. Always happy to have him in a movie. The last person to show about the diner is Paul Bettany, aka Michael Archangel. Paul Bettany was solid. Yeah, Paul Bettany did a good job with what he had. No, he was solid in this movie. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna he fault was, him. He was a strong, silent type. Is what he. He was exactly what he needed to be. He was the Terminator. He was, but his acting wasn't shitty. Let's face it. This is the Terminator ripoff. It right? is. It is a big Terminator ripoff. Okay, so in the very beginning of this movie, one of the first things we're introduced to is Paul Bettany comes down from heaven. He literally falls from the sky. And yeah, land like, on the ground. like John Travolta style. <laughs> what, from Michael? From Michael, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's the same character. They both come to Earth the same way. <laughs> oh, so, oh, I mean, right. Legion well, kind of stole it. Nice job. Nice job, Legion. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 Paul Bettany falls from the sky and he lands on Earth and he has like a slave collar. First off, are angels slaves? Yeah, that makes no sense because angels apparently can make decisions. They have free will because he's definitely choosing not to follow orders in this movie. Yeah, okay, so just like Twilight played fast and loose with vampirism, this movie plays fast and loose with theology, big time. The editing in this movie has some serious problems. Like, they do these really quick, rapid cut edits where things happen through the span of three milliseconds. So, Paul Bettany picks up a knife, a dog barks, Paul Bettany swings the knife, the dog squeals, and then blood flies everywhere. I thought he killed the dog. No, he cut his wings off. Yeah, okay. It, it sure didn't look like in the edit. You know what I didn't understand? Why did he need to cut his wings off? Why, why, did, why did he cut his wings off? What I didn't, I, I mean, I understand cutting the collar off at the very least that's symbolic, but why did he cut his wings off? No It's not like point. he needs to blend in because the apocalypse is occurring. I think people have other issues. Not just that, but like, I'm pretty sure that when he landed on Earth, his wings weren't there. They're retractable. Like he made them come out of his back. Yeah, he did, but then why'd he cut him off? Yeah. <laughs> and, and later we find out that the wings are bulletproof, and they're, uh, like, they're like blades, they're, they're weapons. Yeah, they're weapons, they're bulletproof, and obviously he can fly with them. I guess if he had his wings, he wouldn't need to pick up a, an Uzi, which he does later on, so. Okay, so right, right after this, this confusing scene, Paul Bettany, he's like, I need to get a weapon. So he literally just goes into a random building... That just happens to be filled with weapons. There's no explanation at all to what is going on. He goes into a vault filled with weapons and he comes out wearing like a fi he's, the he's finest wearing, fashions. The wall explodes into a shape of a cross with fire around the edges. He is not exaggerating. Paul Bettany literally blows a crucifix shaped hole through a wall. That's like a Looney Tunes. That's Looney Tune esque. Like where he, if, if he ran through the wall. It would have been the shape of his body, but since he's an angel, it's a cross. You know, <laughs> this happened in, what, the first five minutes of the movie? That really set the tone. I already saw this movie, and I actually forgot about that scene, and I, uh... Oh, man, I couldn't even fucking contain myself. I just burst out laughing. You guffawed, and you said, you fucking kidding me? Yeah, oh. I, uh, yeah, I, I made a noise like that. I, I did, I did. After this stupid scene with Paul Bettany, this pointless setup scene, we fast forward to uh, the staging area of this movie. The whole movie's going to take place inside of a diner throughout the whole thing. And all the characters, they all arrive at the same time. And then they all get stuck for whatever reason at the diner. And then all hell breaks loose. Ha 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 ha! It was at this point when things started picking up when I actually said out loud, how long is this movie? And you know how long had, had elapsed? 
How much time had elapsed? Only 17 minutes had gone by <laughs> before I said, how long is this? <laughs> that is never a good sign. Never. Throughout the course of the movie, we see that people are getting possessed by these angels and their eyes are becoming black and their teeth are coming like, like shark teeth. And I think this movie is really confused with what it wanted to do with these villains. Either are they possessed or were they zombies? Because they acted like zombies to me through most of this movie. There were a few that acted like... I don't know, like Resident Evil type monsters, like the guy, the ice cream truck guy, the elderly woman in the diner. This is one, another one of those movies where I saw the trailer over and over and over again every time I went to go see a movie that year. And the biggest image in that trailer, the big selling point that definitely got people into the seats was this image of this old woman jumping around, crawling on the ceiling and biting people and what she was possessed. I think everybody remembers that. That's the most famous thing to come out of this movie. She was more agile than Peter Parker. That brings up another good point, though. As far as looks are concerned, there were a lot of stupid-looking effects in this movie. Such as? Mr. Ice Cream Man. Okay, yeah, one of the first people to come after after the old woman. She was the first big... She was one of the first monsters that we see. Yeah. The old woman. But she doesn't transform. She do, You see her teeth. Yeah, but that's not really much of a transformation. Yeah, that's, that's another problem. Like, uh, we see one kind of creature, and then we see this completely other new breed of creature show up who only appears once and never again. So an ice cream truck rolls up to the diner, and the ice cream man comes out. What was the song was playing? It was uh, the typical ice cream song. Uh, it hasn't. It hasn't. Yeah, Turkey has in the Straw. Okay, so this ice cream man shows up, and instead of being like the regular people, for reasons unknown, his his face elongates and like his mouth, his jaw just like drops, like it drops a good foot and <laughs> like, a half. like a foot. He's like, Arr! and then his arms and legs elongate, and then he starts crawling on the ground again, like the unborn crawling on the ground and uh, going towards the uh, the the diner. It what looked was terrible. I thought this special effect of this guy looked really poor that brings up another question on top of that why is he able to change the structure of a human being's body he possessed and no, no one, one else, else can does that does that make him stronger I what think were it, they doing when they wrote this movie does that does that make him stronger because it looked like it just made it easier f for betney to shoot him <laughs> <laughs> like why would you elongate your body like that and start just like, like crawling on the ground like i can't explain this locomotion to to anybody listening to this but it looked <laughs> really really stupid like if they were in the jungle that looked like it would have made sense but they were in the middle of an open plain why are you crawling on the ground terrible all right so why were only certain people possessed they they said that in the movie that if you had a weak will it was easy to possess you so well, are, no, we, are we are we let they said to it believe? was easier it was easier to possess someone with a weak will so are we led to believe that every single person that's trapped in this diner had an iron will and couldn't be possessed it seemed like the majority of the people in the diner had all these problems and were very weak and crying and freaking out yeah like the, I would imagine the mother very was very will. neurotic you know yeah if that would have been a fun twist like why didn't the mom get possessed by these angels i got a better question why does Michael have a body and all the other angels have to possess humans? Why don't they have bodies? Oh my God, that's, <laughs> that is unbelievable. That is a really good point. Well, I'm just curious. Why, why does Michael have a body? Michael Gabriel and Gabriel, has... they both come down in their corporeal form. So are we led to believe that they're puppeting all these humans from heaven? Or... No, no, we're not led to believe that because right before they go to storm Earth, all the angels fly down in a tornado formation. They show that. There's a there, there's a cutscene in this movie where Gabriel and Michael are having a really long, boring dialogue, which, by the way, happens 20 times in this movie. One of the scenes, they were back in heaven. And then it shows, like, thousands of angels spiraling down to what you're led to believe is Earth. But they have bodies. They're flying. So then why are they possessing people? <laughs> Why don't they have bodies anymore? Not just that. Why are they possessing people when it's shown that angels have bulletproof wings <laughs> that if they touch you, <laughs> slashes your head off? What, what was the point of uh, possessing all these people? Why are they possessing, like, elderly kids? Like, really, really, like, just, like, naturally weak these guys are, these angels are really heavy hitters. They don't need this subterfuge of pretending to be a little kid and coming up to you and stabbing you. No, they, they can just come fly right up through to you. a window and like just cut you. I did, yeah, which is why I, I didn't, I didn't understand this whole last stand aspect of the diner because if they wanted to, couldn't they just come in and just kill the woman straight away? I got a better question. If God wanted to get rid of the human race, why didn't he just do this? Snap. And poof, everyone's gone. Movie's two minutes long and that's it. What's interesting to me is, all right, these people are getting possessed by 
quote unquote angels. But yep. the name of the movie is Legion, which is supposed to be about possession by devils or demons. Yeah, Satan makes no appearance at all in this movie. I was thinking that the whole time. I was like, okay, God wants to wipe out the human race. So who's, is the bad guy God in this movie? Yeah, God's the villain in this movie. Ridiculous. And then, and, and, and where, where's Satan during all this? Like, wouldn't he have something to say? You, it, I, I thought it would be really interesting if like, okay. Satan h- helped out mankind? Yeah, just yeah. Just like God? Yeah, God says that I'm done with this human race. In the movie, they, they said God's tired of this bullshit. That's an exact quote. God's tired of the bullshit. He's just but, tired of all the bullshit. Yeah, so he's going to wipe out the human race. Okay, what does Satan have to say about all that? Like, it would have been really interesting if like the hero was like a the devil. Wouldn't that have been crazy? It would have made the movie more enjoyable. Because the, the devil would have been like, hey, you know what? These are my toys. You're not going to take them away from me. I feel like Satan is just anti-God. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just he's, just he's, to he's, screw around with him, he, he he'd show Satan's up. like a spoiled teenager. He just if his parents like something, he hates it. This whole movie hinges upon this concept. God tells the angels, "I'm tired of the human race. Get rid of them." And Michael says, "That's wrong." That's a wrong order. Like like he's a soldier in Vietnam ordered to kill a kid and he, and he refuses not to do it. So he gets shunned and, you know, court-martialed or whatever and kicked out of heaven. So the basic premise of the movie is God's wrong and Paul Bettany's going to show him what's right. Not only is he going to show him what's right, but he's quoted as saying... I, I have it right here, actually. Uh, yeah, say it. No, let, let, let's read it together. So you be, uh, <laughs> you, be, you be Gabriel and I'll be Michael. Okay. Okay, sure. This can't be. You've disobeyed him. You gave him what he asked for. I gave him what he needed. If that is not the height of arrogance and hubris, I don't know what is. The va- the sheer vanity in those two lines, it's uh, essentially saying that this being that was created by the by an all-powerful, all-knowing being listen god that can never be <laughs> fallible ever or would undo existence <laughs> like, is going to is going to teach him a life lesson he's teaching him a life lesson listen god i know that you created everything and we are all one <laughs> i wouldn't be here without you but you know what Pfft, you're a fucking idiot let me show you what's what <laughs> are, are you kidding me that's what this movie's about like give me a break was this movie written? Was there a script written for this movie? I think I asked that question, didn't I, while we were watching this. Like, what is going on here? You know what? I I can't even really blame the actors in this movie. It felt like a, someone in high school was like, I got a really great idea, you know? <laughs> no, this doesn't even sound like that. It sounds like a high school English teacher gave a creative writing assignment for homework, and someone came in with this, <laughs> with this script. They're like, check this out. It's called Legion. They're like, why, why are angels in it? I don't know. Angels are cool. But (laughs) I thought Legion's about demons. (laughs) Whatever. What does that say about this movie's plot? If I was a teacher in high school and gave a creative writing assignment and someone handed this in, I would give them an F for it being so incoherent. But but I, I have a better analogy. This movie is like a Mad Lib. They just had like the blank spaces and they were just like, fill it now, now, and verb, now. And then this is what they, this is what they ended up with. Okay, so I want to talk about these, these. Every character in this movie is extremely one-dimensional. They're, they're cardboard cutouts. They're, they're stereotypes, pointless, useless characters. Yet, for some reason, they decide to shoehorn in this character development stuff. Between the boring action scenes, they would stop and just talk. Like, the characters would literally have, like, a soliloquy. They would just go on and on. Charles S. Dutton had one. The pregnant mom had one. I think, uh, oh, uh, Paul Bettany had a bunch. You know who didn't have one and needed one? Who's that? Dennis Quaid. Not enough Quaid in this movie. That's a problem. And you know what? Quaid was in almost the entire movie, and there wasn't enough Dennis Quaid. Not in enough Dennis Quaid. So everybody has this obnoxious speech, and it's the kind of speech where your eyes glaze over, and you're like, okay, come on, let's go. I actually don't remember any of the speeches. None. None. I blocked it out of my memory. This is supposed to be a supernatural thriller. That You know what? That was probably the main problem with this movie, though. There weren't a lot of action scenes. And there, it really wasn't a thriller. You know what the action scenes were? The action scenes consisted of people firing their guns wildly into the air while bullets bounced on the ground. That's it. They can. How many shots of bullet shells were there in this movie? They it, just showed how many bullets they fired. Someone would fire their gun and they would cut to the ground with a bullet falling down. Over and over and over. Oh my god. Okay, so, so fa- we fast forward a little bit and 
we, we learned that the whole point that this is all going down, the reason the annuals are swimming down in this diner is because the pregnant waitress, she's holding Jesus 2.0 in her belly, and the angels want to put a stop to that or else the human race might actually continue. Okay. Which cool. I don't understand because Jesus is supposed to be the embodiment of God as man, right? Yeah. So? So the angels are trying to kill God, the embodiment of God coming again? Oh, no, please, a, please explain this to me. God is trying to kill himself being embodied as man. Yeah, why did God allow this to happen in the first place? Why did he let this immaculate conception take place? It's really funny because he chose Gabriel to come down and end it all, but the first time around, wasn't Gabriel like, yo, Mary, you're knocked up? Huh. Hmm. God's the father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is what Gabriel... They, is, is, what were they doing in this movie? <laughs> is Gabriel even like a... Is he an archangel? Is he like a fighter? Because I thought that he just went around telling people that they got pregnant. Hey, listen, I'm not sure what happened during the Annunciation, but uh, <laughs> I don't think that matters for this movie. But any, anyway, so she's got Jesus in her belly. She's got the new Jesus in her belly. This woman gives birth on this filthy diner floor and a what 15 year old girl delivers the baby okay whatever fine fine i'll let that slide but two seconds after the baby's delivered this girl she jumps up give me a shotgun i'm ready to go she's walking around doesn't childbirth take a lot out of you her belly was completely gone too i don't think oh yeah 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 right her belly that, that happens her belly bump poof God, there a, a lot of interesting things happened to the baby in this movie. Once it was born, this baby was tossed, thrown, and captured. They, I think they chucked it down a cliff. Yeah, they, they showed blatant disregard for the new Messiah in this movie. The new Messiah got in a car crash, I think, five <laughs> minutes uh, after being born. At the, at the very end of the movie, they, they're trying to escape the mother and the, the guy, Jeep. They're blasting so fast down the road, they crash, and as you said earlier, the baby, like, the, the, whole, the whole car flips over and, like, rolls on the ground. And, 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 anyway, so, everyone in the car is fine. No one was wearing their seatbelt. No one. And the girl is okay. Jeep's okay. The teenage girl died for some reason. And the baby, who was in someone's arms, not in a child seat, but in someone's arms, when the car crashed at 100 miles an hour, walks out without a scratch on it. What are the kind of Gs that are exerted when a car spins around at 110 miles an hour? I think a real baby would have burst like a water balloon. But this baby comes out like, eh, no problem. It didn't even cry. They all just disappear, I guess, when they drive away in the Jeep. They're all gone now? Well, because Gabriel came down to finish the job. Oh, yeah, he sounded his big horn. So yeah, so they, they had their final uh, battle. Michael and uh, Gabriel have their final battle. At this point, I could care less what is going on. Dennis Quaid is dead. How do you have a Dennis Quaid movie without Dennis Quaid? I don't care anymore. Whatever. And uh, then, guess what? Gabriel wins. He kills Paul Bettany. But, oh, lo and behold, what happens? <laughs> Paul Bettany actually dies in, and he disappears like a Jedi Knight after, <laughs> after death. Yeah. And, and what happens? He is resurrected as an angel, comes back, and saves the day. How infuriating. How, oh. That's when he says the, the one line, how is this possible? And then Paul Bettany goes, I gave him what he needed. Yeah, I showed God what he needed. And God and God was very happy with him. All okay. right, so, uh, all right. Uh, uh, how, how can God ever be wrong? So stupid. It doesn't even matter, though, because... At this point, Gabriel has shown that God changed his mind via resurrecting Michael because Michael showed him that this is the way it should be. Why is Gabriel still fighting him at this point then? I, Gabriel's entire character <laughs> is designed to do nothing but follow the the rule and Blindly and follow the will of God. All right, so at this point, he should just be blindly following his will since his will has changed. But he continues to fight him. Why? So, so what? stupid. That doesn't make any... Because he's the villain, and the script says he has to. But Ugh. but you just took away his motivation. His motive is gone, disappeared, it changed. What were they thinking? They weren't thinking. This script was written by a kid in high school. <laughs> oh my god, this movie sucks! Ugh. I want to move on with my life. I'm ready to move on. I'm tired of talking about Legion. I remember I, I, I was writing down notes about how you felt emotionally throughout the watching of... Uh, yeah, what did I say? I, I said some choice... Choice things. At the end of the movie, you <laughs> you said, I feel like throwing things. That's exact. I, I really felt like throwing my notes at the screen. Like, I was so upset. At, so, least, at least it made you feel something. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, so that's enough. Uh, 
En- that I- I've had enough of this movie. Let's find out what the real critics have to say about Legion. Sonny Bunch from the Washington Times says, Legion is USDA prime fail. Kate Muir, Times UK says, Bettany's job? Rescuing the modern Mary, a skanky waitress, and saving her unborn child. Our job? Holding back the laughter. Elizabeth Weitzman, New York Daily News says, Even if you overlook the lousy lighting, awkward editing, and uneven acting, there's so much talking and so little story that your mind is likely to wander. And Bob Grimm from the Reno News and Review says, I'm quite confident Jesus would hate this movie. Okay, Martin. The critics didn't like this movie. has an 18% of Rotten Tomatoes. Legion, is it really that bad? Yeah, this movie's this movie's fucking horrible. <laughs> I uh, I don't know what I was thinking the first time I saw it. I'm emba- I, I I am. I'm embarrassed to <laughs> say that. The first time I saw this movie, I said in my heart, I think I gave it a three out of five. But in in the real world, oh man, this movie. If I could give it a one point five, I would. I'm gonna give it a two because it had a few laugh, what the fuck kind of moments. Okay, fine. As for me, is it really that bad? Yes, yes, emphatically yes. It really is that bad. This movie is insulting to anyone who is religious of any sort. It's insulting to anyone who likes plots or coherent movies or structure. This movie is an insult to everything. I, I, uh, I, I, I was going to give it a two the night we saw it. I was going to give it a two. But talking about it now has really... <laughs> my blood is boiling. One. One out of five. That's two ones so far. Yeah. I, you know, I don't give out ones lightly. I save those for the crap of the earth, and uh, I'm dropping on Legion. This movie was a steaming pile. Stay away. In the last episode, we asked you to submit your reviews of Legion. Gina took up the challenge. She wrote an excellent point-by-point review of this movie, and I'm going to read you some of the excerpts. Wow. I want an hour and 40 minutes of my life back. I'm happy I didn't pay to see it. Why did he keep this chick and her kid alive if the kid is man's last hope? I'm thinking that the kid must be the son of Superman. He survived smoking, an early birth, almost being dropped, and being in a car crash where the car flipped over at least four times. Last time I checked, babies were soft and they tend to break easily. This kid is magic and he's only an hour old. So they drive off into the desert, and the movie ends with me wondering where an hour and 40 minutes of my life went. Let's read some listener mail. Rhonda has something to say about the Twilight episode. I thought you guys were spot on with your review on Twilight. Being a teenage girl when the movie came out, I was exactly who Twilight was geared for. Regardless, I thought that it was terrible. Apparently, you don't have to be middle-aged and or a dude to think that this movie is crap. Keep up the good work. Ah, thank you, Rhonda. Are we middle-aged? Ouch. Yeah, right? Burn. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay, the J writes in and says, I just heard the Twilight podcast, and you guys mentioned that the vampires are bedazzled to be fabulous. Well, my circle of friends, some of which are big fans of the book series, the girls, refer to call them simply as glampires. Dan has some pretty interesting fun facts about Twilight. Hey, guys. Loved your episode about Twilight. It was so satisfying to hear you guys reinforce all my sentiments about this overly sensationalized piece of shit. You seem to know a lot more about the movie, but were you aware that these films are responsible for a strange phenomenon in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State that I like to call the Twilight Effect? You see, the main towns in the movies, Fork, La Push, and Port Angeles, experienced some sweeping changes since the release of Twilight. You can see its influence in many of the small businesses trying to cater to Twilighters, aka Twilight fanatics who buy Edward t-shirts and take their pictures next to the sign that says, Welcome to Forks. Anyway, there's big business in bestial pedo necrophilia, so all the local businesses try to cash in with Bella Coffee and Edward Chocolates. There are even Twilight gift shops in all three of these cities that sell nothing but Twilight paraphernalia. And finally, Ryan has some issues with the listener mail from last episode. Ryan writes, I think Inception was popular mainly because of who the director was. Had he not previously directed a very popular superhero movie, I suspect it would have gotten far less of a big reception. If Michael Bay had directed it, for instance, and it was the very same movie, critics would have bashed it and it wouldn't have made as much money. By the same token, if The Prestige had been released after The Dark Knight rather than before, it would have generated a lot more money 
and more critics would have liked it. I think Vanilla Sky would have been more hated now if it was released than it was then because Tom Cruise has fallen out of favor with critics and audiences. Do you agree with that? I think that's a really good point. I mean, Tom Cruise is not the big star he was in yesteryear. That's true, but as far as the plot of the movie is concerned, I think that it's in vogue now. Yeah, maybe if it wasn't the same stars. Okay, he's pretty spot on, though, with uh, the the Inception comment, because the director... If Michael, first of all, if Michael Bay directed that movie, who knows what the fuck we would have got. It would have been. <laughs> Thanks for those emails, guys. You can contact us at yeahitsthatbad at gmail.com. Last episode, we asked you to go to our website and vote on which movie you would like us to review next. Let's take a look at which movie won the poll for the first ever Listener's Choice episode. The choices were One in Rome, The Proposal, and Grown Ups. Grown Ups got off to a tremendous lead, but the proposal slowly worked its way up in the rankings until they were both tied. It wasn't until the poll was about to close that someone stepped up and broke the tie, literally within the last few minutes. So, if you were the person that cast a tie-breaking vote, please send me an email. I want to announce your name to the rest of the world. So, the winner is, with 46% of the vote... The Proposal, starring Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds. This movie is currently available on Netflix Instant or at your local movie rental establishment, so you can play along with us at home. If you've already seen this movie, or if you watch it before next Monday, please send us a review at yadstatbad at gmail.com, and we will read it on the air. Okay, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed what you just heard, please subscribe to the show. Please leave us a positive review on iTunes, And finally, visit our website at yadstatbad.com, where you can share the show with your friends by liking us on Facebook, talking about us on Twitter, or sharing the show via another social media site. If you want to get in contact with us, our email address is yadstatbad at gmail.com, or just go to our website and you can fill out the contact form. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Yo, you heard me. I said, this is supposed to be a Dennis Quaid movie. Where the hell is Dennis Quaid? (laughs) Did you watch it just for Quaid? (laughs) I came for the angels. I stayed stayed for for the the Quaid. Quaid. (laughs) Oh, man. That could be on a button or a bumper sticker. Bumper sticker. Bumper sticker. Bumper sticker.